Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us online. Thank you all for starting your, your day with us here in Charm. And for those of you online, um, welcome. I'm glad we're all gathered here for an exciting discussion this morning on playing for the planet, how we can harness digital learning and gaming uh, for climate action. My name is Lana Wong, and I'm from Moderate the Panel, but I'm also the Director of Communications for the Education Commission. And actually, nearly 10 years ago, I helped to create the Connect for Climate platform at the World Bank. So I'm especially thrilled today that we have a dedicated climate education space here at COP27. And I really want to thank our friends and partners at Earth Day for really coordinating this critical effort because it's about time. Um, education really needs to be part of the conversation, and that's also why we're gathered here today to figure out how can we harness the power of gaming for climate action. So, uh, fun fact, or not even fun fact, well, how many of you out there are gamers? Any takers? Hey, look at that, great. And I, I, I may uh, take a guess that we may have a few parents of gamers. Uh, <laughs> that would include myself. I raised uh, two boys, and so I am no stranger to COD, Call of Duty, uh, you know, Mario Kart, uh, NBA 2K, FIFA, Madden, all of that good stuff. So, so we want to dive in and figure out how we can harness the fact that there are over 3 billion people playing games today. And in combined, in combination, uh, there's a figure that they spend close to or over $200 billion. So this is not a, a market and an audience to ignore, and that's why we are gathered here today to figure out how can we really harness this for good. So without further ado, let me um, introduce our panelists, and unfortunately my, <laughs> here we go, we're good. What's that? So we will start with uh, brief presentations by each of our panelists, uh, and then we will dive into a demonstration of the work, but I'll, I'll save that, and we will make sure also that we have time for Q&A before we close at 10.30. So let me just first uh, introduce our, our panelists. So we have, first up, is Dr. Juliet Rooney Varga. Uh, she is a professor of the Climate Change Initiative at University of Massachusetts at Lowell. Uh, and her favorite game growing up uh, was chess. So let me hand it on over to Juliet. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's probably gonna be, so I'm gonna just, for this, here. So it's, a great, it's great to be here, and I wanna welcome everybody who's here and those of you joining online. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how, as Lana was talking about, we can harness the power of games for good. Is this okay? Yeah, like this. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so again, thank you, and, and it's, really, it's really a pleasure to be here. I feel very privileged to be here. So the, what I want to talk about is how we can... Um, we're okay? Yeah, we're okay? All right how we can uh, leverage simulated experiences for real world action. And I'm part of a big team, um, some of whom are here today, so I just wanna thank all of them from um, Climate Interactive, from MIT Sustainability Initiative, from um, Rutlingen University in uh, Germany and others. And so I'm a professor, I've been teaching for a long time, and I've been trying to figure out how to do climate change education better for a long time. And one theory of how this works is that we provide information, and people learn from that information, and they take informed action, because they've learned. But does this really happen? And I guess one question is, can education really catalyze climate action? Because that's why we're here today. And so, again, I tend to give really, really good lectures, as I'm sure We've is obvious from this video of students that I was giving and a very engaging and stimulating talk about climate science to, and yes, I'm being a bit facetious, the the there they Oops. And the problem, of course, is that there are a lot of barriers to learning, especially when it comes to learning about climate change. So one problem that we know is that 
it's too complex, right? This is a really complex system, the, the climate system, the energy system, all the human systems that are connected to uh, solving these or addressing these issues. People come to this with prior misconceptions. And where I live in the United States especially, oftentimes climate change threatens people's worldview. Um, or their social group doesn't agree with solutions or the problem. And I'm seeing more and more in my, class, in my classrooms especially, but with people all over, that there's also this sense that um, we can't do anything about it, that it's too late. And that kind of gives, that sense of giving up also leads to a lack of learning. So what if instead of giving those really engaging lectures, we played games? And those same students that were pretty bored when I was talking to them. Where this guy's representing the United States, another one's representing China. They're talking about embodied carbon emissions that are crossing borders and who's responsible for them. And very sadly for me, I found out that they learned more doing this than they learned from my great lecture. So I'm, I'm grappling with that still, but I'm gonna kinda go with it. And I guess the question is why? And we've actually done quite a bit of research now to understand what people take away from these simulation-based experiences. And what we find is that through these experiences, people have an experience together. They're immersed in a complex system, and by being immersed in it, they can learn about it more effectively. They learn for themselves, and they also feel for themselves. Oops, are we okay? Um, they, also, they also have an affective response or an emotional response. And they are part of a social group. They find out that they're part of a social group that actually agrees with them, that's going through it together. So through another thing that's kind of interesting is that they find out that they can take action together. And yes, this is just simulated action, but our research shows that that experience of collective efficacy in a simulated environment actually creates a willingness to engage in collective action in the real world. So it can translate into real world action. So I just want to mention that this is not just for students. So we, the tools that we're working on are actually used um, by decision makers at the highest levels. So we've got John Kerry here, um, obviously special envoy for the United States on climate change, mayors and governors across um, the US and elsewhere. And I should mention too that we've at this point um, reached over 130 members of the United States Congress and um, governors, mayors, business leaders, including C-suite executives and, and leaders in the NGO space. People all over the world, in fact. Um, and I will wrap up there. And actually, I think we're going to hold questions for now and pass it on. Great. Thank you, Juliet. So let me hand it over to our next esteemed speaker, Nidhi Upadhyay, who's the Deputy Director of Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. So just fun fact, growing up, or just more recently, Needy said she really loves playing the Stardew Valley Nintendo Switch farming game. Over to you, Needy. Thank you so much for that introduction. Good morning, everyone, and good day to everyone online. My name is Nidhi Upadhyay, and I am Deputy Director of Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships at Ashrock, as Lana said. Um, our center's goal is to reach one billion people with climate resilient solutions. And do this by partnering with private organizations, nonprofits, local organizations, government bodies, financial institutions, and the gaming industry at large. We work with the International Game Developers Association. They have a group that we work with. And through our senior fellows and experts, we, we engage with the Playing for the Planet Alliance of the UNEP, um, and we work with multiple gaming companies uh, across the world. For us as a center, we tackle heat, extreme heat, as a climate hazard, and we focus all our efforts, um, all our channels, to, to address this issue of extreme heat. So even our gaming initiative works with gaming companies to insert climate solutions that, that deal with that issue, that educate people and raise awareness and try to drive action towards extreme heat. We, 
we do this in multiple ways. I just want you all to know that games are a very natural way for people to learn about climate change. They are they're an interesting way and uh, an engaging way, as you've seen in Juliet's video as well, to learn about these things. So we, as a center, do this in three ways. One is we partner with the large companies, the AAA gaming companies, to insert climate solutions in their, in their narrative. So we try to partner with them, we try to you know, work with them to see how we can insert this into their game design, into their narrative. The second is we work with indie game companies, the smaller game companies, before they actually launch the games, we try to partner with them and see if there's alignment in what they're trying to do and how we can have climate resilient solutions inserted into those, those games. The third part that we do is we have a center of excellence within our gaming initiative. And that, we work in two ways to deal, to, to deal with this issue of extreme heat and climate hazards at large. One, we do workshops. Our experts and our senior fellows, and we also have education experts, we have climate science experts, we have gaming experts, who work with game developers, designers, and game writers to educate the industry on what climate resilience is, so that when they are out there building games and talking about these issues, they, they know exactly what they're saying, and they know what solutions to implement in the games. The second way um, is through virtual reality and other technologies that, that are upcoming. We recently finished a report and we are actually doing a VR prototype in the Resilience Hub, so do come check it out, uh, for the next two days um, on scenarios and how you can use virtual reality for decision makers and show them that two scenarios. One, in 2040, if you've not taken climate adaptation or resilient solutions, what would the world look like? You'll be thrown right into a hurricane in Miami, Florida in this prototype. The other scenario is you walk through it. You actually have the controller to make the decision on what solutions you want to implement. And you see the other scenario of 2040, where a world where you have green roofs, where you have trees, where you have solar panels, where you have cooling mechanisms to protect your city. But this tool is being used to drive decision makers and to let them know that you still have the chance. I know we've, there's a very small chance, but there is a chance to make changes right now and make this a better world for everyone. So these are the, these are the three main strategies in the way in which we are raising awareness, educating people, and our goal is to drive action on the ground through the work that we're doing. So that's right from policy making to action on the ground. We, we have a top-down and bottom-up approach across our streams, and we do right from impacting policy to setting up rooftop gardens in Chennai, India. So we, we have a wide range, and we want to reach people where they are, which is why over three billion people playing games, half of which are women, we want to make sure that we are where they are, and we are giving them the right tools to do something for themselves, their communities, their livelihoods, to protect themselves. Um, just to give you all an example of how we do this, I have two trailers that I'm going to play for you all. Can you help me with the trailers? Okay, great. These are two examples of our, of our games. This one is called Garden Story, and we've worked with them to insert climate solutions in their games. This story is about Concord, the grape, and this grape is working with his community to make this a more livable place, to protect nature, to make sure the trees have enough water, and the, the, the water insecurity issues are tackled with. But they do that in a fun way. So you're learning about these things in a very interactive, fun way um, as, you, as you go along in the game. And then the next, if I can jump to the next video. This is a game called Eco that we partner with. And this is a more in <laughs> game where um, you, you go into this world 
and there is a planet that you're supposed to protect. And your role is to work with other players. It's an online community, so you work with other players to actually build a government system, an economy, tax laws. You build all of that, and you have to make sure that you balance the resources on this planet it doesn't, so that it doesn't overheat and it doesn't get destroyed. And that is the, that is the main focus of this game. I'll, I'll stop it here, because I know it's a long trailer. But thank you so much. That was, those were my remarks. Super. Thank you so much, Needy. Now let's hand it over to our youngest panelists uh, on, our, on our panel, Michael Backlund from Climate Science, the president of Climate Science, who, I'm, I should add, had a set of Pokemon sheets in his bedroom growing up. Avid Pokemon player. Last week, I met one of the most interesting people that I've met in my entire life. Now, he was somewhere across of AI scientist, economist, and uh, ecologist. But we were talking about linguistics. Now, did you know that the word teach comes from the Greek world word to put in, where the word educate comes from the word word to put to pull out. I think that's a fundamental difference that many people forget, and educators forget when we talk about education. Now, as a self-identified idiot, and as a person who spent most of his house, high school outside of it. I didn't always find my education the most engaging. I, I was always fascinated. I was, alway, I was always fascinated with concepts, abstract things. I love to analyze things. And especially, especially, I, I'm especially passionate about psychology. But my school system never supported me in that way. It always tried to give me things that I wasn't interested in. And eventually, it got, instead of helping me, it got in, in my way of getting the information that I want. I think most people are naturally curious. They are interested in learning. But sometimes, we, our education system is built on maximizing the amount of knowledge rather than prioritizing people. So that's where games come in, right? And I'd like to pose a question. There's two options. You have a choice, to be bored or to be excited. The essence of life and games is adventure. You don't know where you're going to end up. And what we have done in climate science is among other things, we prioritize the learner. We prioritize what happens naturally. We don't push things down people's throats that they don't want. So among other things, what climate science tries to do is we try to make learning about climate change easy to understand and reliable at the same time through digital resources. And gamification is a very, very import important part of that. We have courses, we have kids' books, we have YouTube videos, and among all, we recognize that people are visual creatures. We like to see things, and if you're like me, I'm very skeptical of a lot of things. I question everything. So when I see proof and when I see things, it's much easier for me to believe, and especially when it comes in a way that is quick for me to understand, and I don't have to spend too much time. I'm, I'm young, as we, we established here already. My attention span is not the best. Um, <coughs> so an example would be um, in climate science courses, which are used by people in 190 countries, and where we've managed to not only teach people about what climate change is, but after people complete it, they really 
know locally and everywhere what to mitigate, what to adapt. They understand that the energy uh, crisis is the biggest one in climate change. They understand that the agricultural systems need to be reimagined. They understand that we don't only have to mitigate, but we also have to adapt. Really high level stuff that most people in the world don't really know yet. Um, and the way that we achieve this is that we for, for, for we write things in a way that normal people can understand it. And the second thing is um, we don't write too much before asking a question. So we interact with the learner. The learner gets to put their input, l the learner gets to ask questions, and then we connect them also to real life communities where learning is not something only that you have online. It's, it's supposed to be something real. It's supposed to be practical in the end of the day. Um, but with that said, I think it's a good time to skip to a video to give a short um, teaser of what climate science is trying to do. And when, I, when I'm showing this, I hope that you ask, uh, you ask yourself, where, do, where would you rather get your climate education from? Would you rather it be through an engaging video or would you rather it be on a social media post or a school book that has maybe one picture at best if they're generous? Um, does this work? Oh, there we go. Solve climate change. We are climate science. We make solutions to climate change easy to understand. So that we can take real action together. together. Since our humble beginnings as an Instagram account launched from a dorm room in late 2019, we've created resources enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of learners. We offer in-depth courses, short animated videos, global competitions, children's books, resources for schools, and a lot more. But most importantly, we focus on solutions to climate change because we want to empower learners to take action. Our content is accurate, actionable and accessible because we want to make learning fun. So we link to scientific papers and have multiple reviewers look at each piece before publishing it. Climate science has grown into a community of 900 highly modern And Michael, I think, is living testimony of why youth voice matters and why youth ingenuity and the kind of authenticity and youth perspectives need to be centered in this conversation, both in climate and in education. So, Michael, I wasn't trying to embarrass you and highlighting your youth. I actually wanted to say this is why you are here, because uh, I think we should all be humbled by the profound and uh, kind of genius things that you're doing. So, bravo, bravo, bravo. <laughs> and now if I can turn over to our final panelist, Tim Kelly, who is the executive director of Earth HQ, which is the media arm of the Global Commons Alliance, and he's also the co-founder of Planet 3. Over to you, Tim. Thank you. Can you hear? Okay, a uh, little closer. There we go. Thank you. Well, Planet 3 is a game-based platform to teach earth and life science to middle school students. And Michael is right about one thing. We, we've been boring students to death when it comes to trying to convey science to them. Studies show that uh, in kindergarten, science is the most interesting topic for most kids. By eighth grade, it's the least interesting topic, and that's a lot of, of that has to how, how to do uh, with how we teach science. <coughs> Especially in an age when we're facing a, uh, a planetary emergency, we should have every student coming out of, in middle school and high school, become familiar with, uh, with the climate crisis and with the science of s how, the how to maintain the life support systems of the planet. So what the Planet 3 is um, 
is create an ecosystem where students are avatar-based participants of uh, the Planet 3 orbiter, and they're sent on missions, and, and really we utilize adventure and exploration as a way to, uh, to light the fire. Uh, again, t you know, Michael mentioned education as trying to pull from people. There's also trying to educate people by filling a bucket full of knowledge is one way. The other is to light a fire of excitement and interest, and that's what we're trying to do with Planet 3 is provide a, uh, a platform that really immerses students in real-world uh, adventures and real-world data and get them engaged in what the big solutions are to, to solving the, the planetary emergency, which, which is, to some degree, everybody's responsibility going forward. But I'll just give you a brief glimpse of what Planet 3 looks like and how it works. Uh, and I guess that's in my hands here. Let's see. Earth. Okay, we're going to try to go back here. Earth, it's the only home we've got, and we need to protect it. That's why we've recruited you. But before you can protect Earth, you have to explore and understand it. You'll be based here on the Planet 3 Orbiter. You'll begin each mission from your personal observation deck. From here, you'll use the orbiter's advanced technology to investigate and monitor Earth's life support systems. Largest living thing on the planet. Blue whale. Ha! Meet General Sherman, a giant sequoia that's as heavy as 10 blue whales. I'm predicting the hurricane is going to make landfall here. And that's where I'm sending you. We're detecting abnormal seismic activity in Iceland. That might be the sign of an impending volcanic eruption. I'm sending you down to investigate. Your mission, conduct on the ground research, figure out if the volcano is going to blow, and save lives. Lots of people are depending on you. We've built this immersive platform in, in Unity, uh, but it, and not only is it simulating the real world, we're also connecting students and teachers to real world data so that they can also engage in learning about how the climate and nature crisis imp is impacting uh, the world that they live in and, and to look at local solutions and what they can do personally to make a difference. Uh, so, th it again, it's that idea of getting students engaged uh, and giving teachers uh, tools so that they are not solely responsible for being uh, the sage on the stage, so to speak. A lot of teachers, first of all, you know, we're, we're missing uh, a lot of teachers in, the, in many parts of the world, particularly I know in the U.S. there's a shortage of teachers. There's a huge shortage of science teachers, and one of the reasons that... Uh, that teachers don't teach about climate is that they don't feel comfortable. They don't feel that they have, that they're up to speed on the latest science. So, so these digital platforms provide uh, automatically up-to-date information. And in, in, Planet, in the Planet 3 platform, the students play through the game and do the learning. The teacher is the guide on the side, assi making assignments and so forth, but it's not it's not all on the teacher to have the latest uh, data and science and be able to talk infinitely about it. We're trying, to, we're trying to actually let students learn by doing, which is the great thing about games. And uh, so th that's, that's Planet 3. Thank you, Lana. Thank you, Tim.
So we can't have a conversation about play and gaming without, I think, diving straight in. So I'm bringing Juliet back up, and we're going to have a live demo of uh, one of her simulation programs. So take it away, Juliet. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So, um, so I have a question for you. What is your favorite climate solution? What's something that you are thinking about that if we really scaled up, if we really pushed hard on, would make a difference in this world here at COP? If you were advising negotiators, if you were advising leaders, what would you tell them we need to do? Antonio Guterres is counting on you. If you could just check in with a neighbor really quickly. Um, say four, 30 seconds. Talk with your neighbor. What's one solution you can agree on? Maybe panelists could do the same. <laughs> I can talk to you, Lana, if you want. <laughs> yeah. How is OK. And I'm so distinguished advisors to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. What solutions are we here to implement? This is COP27 for implementation. What should we do? And I, I'm going to just orient you for a second to a model here we called En-ROADS. Um, and what you see here is on the, um, the graph on the upper left is the global energy supply. So you can see that we don't have a time turner. We have to deal with what we've already done in the past. So going from 2021, 2022 backwards, our observed data from the actual, you know, from the real world, historically, what's happened? You can see that little tiny dip in uh, use of energy from COVID, um, 2020, right? We all know when that happened. And then going out um, forward to the rest of the century, those are the decisions that you're here to make today, okay? That's what we're relying on. And so you can see, too, we've got in brown, coal, red is oil, in blue is natural gas, in green is renewables, solar, hydro, um, wind, geothermal, in pink is bioenergy, and the little line at the top in cyan is nuclear. Um, so advisors to the United Nations, as you know, we've got then greenhouse gas emissions that result from all of those um, energy sources, and if we do nothing today, we expect to see an outcome of 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius by the end of the century, an outcome that is um, devastating uh, for our young people and people everywhere. So what's, what are your solutions? What do you want to do? Yes. You, what? Let's go with one for now. Electrification of transport, yeah, of buildings. You're sneaking in too. All right. <laughs> okay, so the English technical advisor is telling us to electrify. It's a great idea. Let's do it. So if we go ahead and push on electrification of buildings and industry, we're talking about heat pumps, right? We're talking about switching from furnaces for, for heating water to... Um, to electrical uh, uh, approaches to that, to more efficient um, uh, appliances. And here what you can see is that you've got, if we pull that lever one more time, or if we play replay, you can see what happens. So if we look, electrification is increasing our green energy, our renewable energy, that's great, nice work. We're also seeing that we have an impact on emissions and on temperature, so we've got going from 3.6 down to 3.4 degrees Celsius, we're making some progress. I think you also want to do some electrification transport. So if we pull that lever as well, we can see what happens. Uh, give the simulator a moment to catch up. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and pull that. And so we're highly incentivizing electrification of transport. And if we play that one more time, we can see now oil getting squeezed out quite a bit and getting replaced with some renewables. Also some coal bumping up because unfortunately you didn't do anything to 
to depress coal yet. Um, <laughs> and so, so we're making some more progress and we're at 3.3 degrees Celsius. Was there something else you were yearning to do? More, more nuclear, let's ramp up the nuclear. So if we go ahead and subsidize nuclear energy or have a breakthrough cost reduction, we can see, and so what's one of the problems with that, right, is we're seeing nuclear growing, that's helping, um, which is a good thing. Of course, nuclear takes time to build. It's not cheap, so it's not ramping up maybe as fast as we want it to. Do we have other other solutions in the room? Yeah. Uh, Large-scale reforestation. Okay, so large-scale reforestation or afforestation. So we're hearing a lot about this these days, and we're going to go ahead and pull the afforestation line. So we're planting trees and allowing areas to go back to being forests that were forests. And if we play that again, what we're seeing is it does help. You can see that we're getting some removals of, of carbon dioxide growing towards the later part of the century. But one of the problems is that it takes time for that to happen. And we don't have a whole lot of land available for that to happen. So it does help, but we're still, sadly, I don't think uh, the UN Secretary General would be terribly happy with this outcome. We're at 3.1 degrees Celsius. What else can we do? Reduce coal and oil. Okay, so coal and oil. So why don't we, why don't we just discourage the use of coal and oil? Great idea. And that's certainly helping, especially because now we've electrified and we're now pushing down on that coal. And let's go ahead and reduce oil as well. So we're also making a difference there. You're at 2.9 degrees. Is there anything else? Yeah. So when you just shifted coal and oil left, what got shifted up? To replace let's, it. Let's go take a look at that. Let's play that play that one more time and take a look and see what happened. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and play that. So let's go let's go slowly so we can take a look and say what do you see changing? Okay, so part of what's happening is that renewables are growing to take to take the place, even though nobody has put a price on carbon yet, but We've got, we've got a, a case where now you've got renewables growing and oil can get squeezed out partly because you have electrified, which is great. I guess what the first thing I looked at after you shifted coal and oil was the slider, the slider for renewables. Yeah, so you, you want to subsidize renewables, no? I mean, no? So, so when you shift coal and oil, there isn't an automatic slider that goes right. So part of what's happening in the model is there's actually a market, I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to, but there's a market clearing mechanism that allows mm -hmm. the, um, the market basically to choose the, uh, the lights are always going to be on, we're not going to allow demand not to be met, but you have a situation where um, demand will be met with sources that are available and less expensive. If I can... Uh, so yep. when you shift coal and oil left, something yep. has to replace it, yes. and yet the renewable slider stayed unchanged. Ah, yes. And so now, if yes. you add more renewables, you've already added, that's, that's what I'm trying to get Got at. Got it. So, yeah, and so I think what you're saying is, so the slider hasn't changed because the slider reflects our decisions, although the mar what, the, what the model is allowing to do is it's taking into consideration the interactions between different policies, um, so you, you, what you see is that one policy has an effect on other policies. I know we need to wrap up, so I want to go ahead and maybe just, is there maybe one more solution from the audience that we could, uh, Eduardo. Hi, hi Juliet. Uh, I would uh, suggest energy efficiency for the infrastructure. That okay, so we're going to pull hard on energy efficiency for buildings. We're insulating our homes, we're making our manufacturing processes more efficient, we're depressing energy demand. Could you go ahead and, yep. 
Okay, and so again, we're, we're making progress, but we've still got a problem in that we haven't quite done enough to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Yep. The carbon price. Carbon can price. Okay, let's go ahead and see what happens if we really pull hard on a carbon price. Okay. And you can see that that is going a long way. We are almost there. And of course, we're generating revenue. If maybe we could do one more thing, which is to reduce those short-lived gases, methane, and of course nitrous oxide is a pretty long-lived gas, but other, other non-CO2 gases. And I want to just take a moment to congratulate you. <laughs> and, and thank you for achieving a temperature outcome that's below two degrees Celsius by 2100. And maybe we can just take a moment to imagine what a future like that might look like. And uh, I did want to ask one, for one more solution, which was something that we had talked about earlier, which is what? Education. Okay. And I think that kind of comes back to a question that maybe we all have for you, which is clearly, given all the craziness that we're seeing here at COP, many of the decisions that are being made, many of the solutions that are being pushed forward that may not actually get us there, it's clear that we still have a lot of work to do in the education space. It's not a slider on our model, but it is a slider that we all can push together. And so I just want to thank you for your work in that space and hope that we can find new ways to to push that one together in the real world. Thanks. Thank you so much, Juliet. And yes, um, that is why we're here in the Climate Education Hub. So as fantastic as that, that model and that simulation is, I think it cannot be said enough that education and climate really do have those co-benefits and must be seen as a win-win solution. So we have about 15 minutes left. I'd love to get more conversation going amongst and between our panelists. Um, but I am just going to kick off our discussion question with, um, with, with, a question, with a question from me. Sorry, I'm a moderator. I get, to, I get that prerogative. So uh, at the Education Commission, we've been working with Kenya, Ghana, and Rwanda on something called the Innovative Pedagogies Project. So that's really trying to raise awareness amongst um, policymakers and schools and communities about the importance of using engaging, inclusive, adaptive, and playful ways of teaching to really make sure that the learning outcomes and the learner is centered. And so um, I think everything that we've talked about, all the incredible platforms that we've showcased, really do hit on the engaging, adaptive, playful bit but I did want to just talk about the inclusion and equity issue and the digital divide, because here we are at Africa's COP, and sadly there are many schools um, that are struggling to even just have electricity, much less connectivity and devices. So I may just, if, it, if it's okay, just pass the mic down the line to see how you think the whole gaming uh, industry and these game-based platforms can, can address that issue. So that's that. Thank you so much for raising that. That's such an important issue to raise. Um, I, what I can say in terms of our own work is that um, we've done research to look at how, at what the impact, the learning impact is, and also really importantly on how um, simulations and games affect learners' motivation, academic motivation, and and identification with. Um, sort of green STEM careers. And what we find is that, that learners from disadvantaged communities in the United States especially, but also around the world, um, actually make the same or greater gains in terms of their learning outcomes using these approaches compared to conventional approaches. So I think it's a very promising way to go. Of course, if you don't have access to electricity, you need to take a different approach. But there are games, there are, um, many tools available to, to do just that. So I think that's really an important point and something that we need to con continue to look at. So we 
we work on the ground with communities. And the one thing that we fully understand is that you cannot win this without working with partners on the ground and local communities, local governments, local organizations who actually know the essence of the community. So taking COVID, for example, I think that really showed us it, that how deep the, the digital divide is because kids did not have access to online learning and it was hard to get them to school. It was harder for the teachers to actually do that. So I think a solution, if we can think of it in that way, is to partner with local organizations, um, companies that would want to work with communities and local governments to sort of drive the, the agenda on how do you give them access to internet, to computers, to devices, to electricity, and work on policies that deliver on that. Um, to give you a quick example, so Eco, the game that I showed you, they've tried to work with teachers um, in schools in, in certain countries to have the teachers learn about the game so that they can teach the students. So if we work with companies and schools on the ground and get those schools equipped with these devices and with, the, with internet, they can still learn about it. So that, like you said, there are ways to, to go about it. And then I'd, I'd like to mention another partner we have, SEVA, which is a self-employed women's association in India. They work with women's self-help groups in India, and they use mobile phones to teach them about, you know, for, for skills development and give them the right information they need to live a good life, to earn their livelihood. So I think there are solutions out there, it's a matter of scaling. So I think all of y'all that work with local partners, um, keep, keep that push on because they know the communities best to, to make this happen. So, <clears throat> um, I'll start with a I'll give two reasons why this is important, and then I'll go to a fundamental barrier in front of it. The fir first one, we'll start with a little bit of fluff. You know, climate change is the world's greatest team challenge, right? It's a collaborative challenge. How can we solve it if any country is not included or has access to the ability to make better decisions, which is fundamentally what climate education is about. The more practical front is, we need these areas. We can't solve climate change without them, because in 10 years, 20 years, you know, they're going to be the human capital of the world. It is not a smart bet to make to have the human capital left out of a sustainable development process. And the only way that that can be achieved is climate education. Now, to the barrier. Working with local partners obviously works. And I'm going to put the elephant on the table. You know, we work with local partners too in around 12 countries in Africa, you know. But if we put the elephant on the table, it's hard. It's really, really difficult to work in these spaces where there's no internet connection because one of the things that internet does with these kind of games, you know, it, it, it allows this, right? It, it also, what, another thing that is in digital ed education is it allows people to access information before governments catch up, which, take a lot of, which takes a lot of time. And we've had had progress on that in this COP, but not enough. And that's always the story. So we can't wait for them, right? So the two solutions we need to increase funding for this we've never we've never we've never prioritized funding education everyone talks about education everyone wants other people to get educated but don't want to get educated themselves right we knew about climate change a long time ago we've never done we've never prioritized it it's it we should have done it a long time ago but it's never too late we need to start now right the second thing is and I think, and this is a bit of, I suppose, of my point of view on this. Rather than betting on the physical education and only going through that, I would rather bet on the internet revolution. 
I think the lack of access to internet is one of the greatest injustices and disadvantages in this century. And it's clear the world is going to that direction. So I am calling in every nonprofit, every organization, private sector company that works on internet access in Africa, in rural regions, in India, to collaborate and to work together with climate education organizations and education organizations in general. Organizations that provide hardware in these areas. Talk to us. Let's make it happen. Let's put climate education in there. We can help you scale. That way, we reach not only that we build a future that is much more equitable and has a lot more opportunity, but also we scale climate education significantly faster and cheaper. Thanks, Michael. Um, <clears throat> we are going to be testing Planet 3 in schools in Botswana and Kenya this coming year in 2023. But the digital divide still exists, still a huge problem. It was, it was improved somewhat, you know, not surprisingly because of COVID. COVID really enforced, you know, billions of people to be connected online. Uh, and, and it did broaden it. But the, the challenge for game-based education products is, you, you know, you really need at least a smartphone. And because we're, we're moving towards more of a handheld experience for Planet 3 uh, and then working with schools that provide hardware. We're still, in many parts of the world, not going to be in a one-to-one -one basis uh, in terms of hardware. Plus, there's still going to be issues with bandwidth. So there's no, um, there's no uh, kind of putting a pretty face on this issue. It is continuing and will continue, but there are potential for breakthroughs and obviously more investment in education and ability for broadband uh, access around the world is going to continue to hopefully make progress through techn technological solutions and so forth. Uh, but I think I think it uh, for for us what we're doing with Planet Three is is it trying to make it really accessible to you know most schools, uh, most teachers, and most students, uh, and we think we can do that over the next three or four years. Time is short, but we do want to just kind of keep this interactive and going. So we, I actually wanted to invite our panelists to propose questions to each other. So does anyone have a, a question, a burning question from I was, Tim? I was just curious for, for Nidhi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I think I was wondering if what the receptivity in, in the AAA gamers com dev development community is to incorporating kind of climate stories into into the new platforms they're building so we we conducted a workshop um at the game developers conference in san francisco earlier this year and we also did one recently at the india game developers conference and we had people from AAA game gaming companies attend the session and they were so receptive to actually learning about climate resilience in, in what they're doing because it's, it's not surprising now that I'm in, in, this, in the ecosystem, but there are so many game developers and designers who are highly concerned about climate change. And they, need, they, they are experts in designing and developing these games, but having access to the knowledge that we can provide through through these workshops, that's when they... Tend to be a, it tends to be a younger community, right? The deaf yes. community. It is a younger community for sure. Um, but we... I would say that, yes. It's, it's the younger, early 30s, late 30s community that, that is really interested in this. And we have the National Game Developers Association. They have a climate special interest group that we work with. And there were members from, from that group that attended it as well. We've done online workshops with them. And there's always engagement and curiosity around how to do this. Because they, 
they want to learn how to actually implement it, they can do the game designing. We, we don't tell them what to do there, but they, they just need to know about climate resilience. So there's definitely great reception on that. And is the proportion of male to female, is, is there a growing audience of female gamers? Yes, absolutely. Even now, it's different platforms in how, in you know, who's using what platform to play games, but almost 50% of gamers across the globe are women. So that, that exists, that is happening, and we're going to see more of that. We're going to see more of equality and equity there. That's exciting. Yeah, actually, I do have a question. Um, I'll go to Juliet first. On the scenarios that you show, do you all conduct this with you know, certain focus groups or working groups? And what sort of reactions do you get when you actually go through this process? Because like I said, our VR prototype is based on scenarios. And we get certain emotional responses, like, oh my god, I, I fell into the water. And obviously, this is different from that. but would love to hear of what sort of reactions you're getting from people on that. Yeah, um, sorry, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think, so our research has shown that um, people gain a sense of urgency and also hope, empowerment, and agency through going through these simulation-based experiences. And I think most psychologists would say, like, you know, of course, like that's what matters the most. As a scientist and as a science educator, I have to admit that when we learned that um, they gain knowledge, but it's actually their gain in a sense of urgency that drives whether they take action, so their intent to take action, and also that drives their desire to learn more. And there is no statistically significant association between a gain in knowledge and to gain an intent to take action and to gain uh, and, you know, a desire to learn more. So in other words, it's the feelings that drive what people do. <laughs> and I think, again, most psychologists would have been like, yeah, duh. But as a science, you know, as a professor who's like up there lecturing all the time, like, you know, that's sort of like, oh, wait, I got to really change what I'm doing because what we want is we want to have changes in emotion that are grounded in gains in knowledge, which is what we see with the simulations. But then we also need to give people space to have those feelings. And I think the other thing that I think is really different from our approach compared to, you know, you hear a lot in the climate change communication community, at least I do, that, you know, don't scare people, don't focus on fear, like don't, don't, you know, you need to focus on hope. And I totally agree with that. But I think that when you have a sense of urgency that's intrinsically generated, that's coming from a simulated experience, that's really different than telling somebody you should be afraid. Um, and so it, it, you know, it's right. It's like, it's kind of like outrage is the guardian of social justice. That's, that's what we see. I'd love to comment on that as well um, with a personal take. Um, growing up, I felt a lot of climate anxiety myself. I'm currently also uh, advising a couple of me climate mental health organizations too. Um, and I, I try to be very open about this because it's significantly worse if you think that you're the only person who's going through this. Nowadays, I don't feel this. I do have problems in other sides, but in climate, I'm quite, I, I'm pretty good. Uh, and I'm glad to say that. And education was the part that helped me cope with that. And with climate, it's a catastrophe, and uh, it, it, it's really bad. It's wreaking havoc. You know, you go to Pakistan, you find out in a second, um, and it's only going to get worse. That's also what we tell everyone, right? Um, and you know, if you have a, we have other catastrophes in life, right? If you fall down, you break a bone. The first thing you have, you're sick. You don't know what's happening, right? The first thing you do is you go on Google, you search what's happening to me. You get more information because then you get. Uh, your, the ability to make better decisions, right? Um, and we should treat climate change exactly the same. You're not alone. There's a lot of people who are going through the same thing. There's millions of people around the world who are trying to take climate action, who are doing beach cleanups, who are trying to have more sustainable fashion, right? In fact, those are good actions, but those are not enough. 
we need to have a more diverse range of actions. And climate activism, we need to live in a world where climate activism, where people hear about climate activism, they would start thinking about engineers. Um, but the fact that we have those millions of people means that you're not alone and means that you, ha you can find a community. And there are resources available, and we are all working extremely hard of making them accessible. Um, so with that, I think I really, really relate to the experience on a personal level, and that's what we can also see in our programs um, and in our content. We, we get messages every, and emails every day that, oh, this cleared up so much for me I, I know what I want to do with my life now. Fantastic. Well, on that hopeful note, um, I think we need to wrap up our Playing for the Planet panel. Thank you so much, Juliet, Needy, Michael, Tim, for all the innovative work that you're doing to harness the power of play and gaming for climate action. And let's all go from eco-anxiety to eco-optimism and try and scale these really practical tools and solutions that are there and use the platforms that we can to come together and make sure we make that connection between climate and education and action. Thank you very much. I'm Lana Wong. Thanks for joining. <laughs>